we are going to be reviewing Wicked Saints by Emily A. Duncan, which, drumroll please, combines a Russian style fantasy with Lovecraft horror. And it unsurprisingly works very well. Our two point of view characters are Seraphim and Nadia, who are on opposite sides of the same war. Seraphim is the High Prince of Trinavia and an accomplished blood mage. He is tired of the war. He has spent the last few years on the front lines and knows that his country cannot survive for much longer. Nadia is the last clerk left in Kalia Zin, a country with a history of saint clerics that have met terrible ends. And Nadia was claimed by the god of death Marzenia, but she can also speak to all the gods, making her extremely powerful, but also the last hope of her country. Trinavia and Kalia Zin split hundreds of years ago over differences about the gods. The Trinavians did not want to be beholden to the gods and developed blood magic. Meanwhile, the Kalia Zin really just want the Trinavians to accept the gods back into their life and they call the Trinavians heretics. Nadja and Seraphim clash, but Seraphim gets recalled to Trevania for a relic, aka a festival to choose his consort. But really, Seraphim's insecure father has been conspiring with the blood mage priests, called the Vultures, and Seraphim's life might be in danger. So Nadia decides to infiltrate Trinavia with her friend group, which includes Malakiash, an ex-vulture, and two Akola expats, Parajan and Rashid. Let's start with the best thing about Wicked Saints, and that is the world building and tone. There is a definite feeling of dark creepiness about everything in this world. Not from one thing in particular, but from everything. The landscapes are barren and icy, they're filled with cold deep lakes and snow-covered mountains. And each chapter is preceded by a short excerpt about a saint from Kalia Zin who died terribly. And on the other side, in Trinavia, you have the vultures who are described as horrific, monstrous creatures that had power tortured into them. They seem like they would be perfectly at home in a Resident Evil game. A boss just waiting there to fuck up your shit. <laughs> and everyday life does not seem very comfortable at all because, you know, as everyday people, you're stuck in two war-torn countries in a place that doesn't seem to give a damn about their peasants. So there is nothing quite comfortable about anything in this world. And that uncomfortable tone helps feed into the cosmic horror elements of the story. Because the gods, when they are described, don't look anything like Apollo or even poor Hephaestus. They're described as having wings and limbs with mouths at the joints and too many eyes and just generally unpleasant looking. They are more than human and more than monsters. They're just more in an indescribable kind of way. Finding out what the deal is with the gods is what's going to be the theme of the series and is what's going to have you coming back to find out what happens next. As for the characters Nadia, Malakiash, and Seraphin, they're the most fleshed out and the side characters orbit around them and clearly have stories, but they aren't fleshed out to the point where you really care about them yet. Nadia has an interesting dilemma because she's been told all her life that her only duty is to serve the gods and she's never really questioned that before because for all her life they've always been there for her and they kind of feel like her friends. But as the story goes on she has to make tougher and tougher decisions and she becomes more and more aware that if the gods wanted they could deny her magic. And hey, if you have to appease your magic dealer every time you want to do a little magic, do you really have free will? Seraphin's problems are a lot more straightforward. Survive the political intrigue and figure out what his father and the vultures are up to. He's interesting, he's also just less complicated than that yet. It's a long ways into the story before the two interact in a meaningful way, and when they do finally meet, it's exciting to think about how they can change the world with their magic. As for Nadia's relationship with Malakish, it's very insta -lovey. I mean, he's a vulture, part of the cult that hunted down most of the Kalias and clerics, but it doesn't take very long or too much hardship for them to start up a relationship. Which, in this case, is kind of weird because Nadia does not trust Malakiash. Her inner monologue is very much like, Man, I have feelings for this guy, but he's a vulture. He is really hot though, but I know nothing about him. Maybe if I just make out with him a little bit I'll get to know him more, but like, I don't trust him. That makes Nadia and Malakiaj's case of insta-love one of the most interesting cases of insta-love because I was never sure if I should trust him in the whole book, which is what Duncan was going for, and she pulled it off. As a whole, 
The plot made sense and was generally interesting. Flow-wise, it was a little slow in the middle, but it more than makes up for it with the ending. I found the end just a bit confusing. There were a couple of elements that were kind of just new and thrown in at the end that came in from the world building side that didn't quite get explained well enough for the ending to make a whole ton of sense to me but I get the feeling that we're gonna get a lot of that explained in the next book. The next book is Ruthless Gods, which I got an arc of, so we will be reviewing it at some point, but as for Wicked Saints, it was a solid first book. Yes, some of the side characters could have been a bit more fleshed out, and the romance suffered from insta-love, but there was a lot of creative world building and a central interesting dilemma that was enough to keep your attention throughout. That's all for this review, so if you want spoilers for Wicked Saints, check out our spoilers review and stay tuned for our eventual review of Ruthless Gods. And we have more cosmic horror stuff coming out for May Madness Month, so woohoo!